everyone, welcome to Harvest Online. My name is Lee and I have the joy and privilege to be the lead pastor here at Harvest. 
Um, no matter where you're tuning in from, we'd love to be able to connect with you during the time of our service. If you wouldn't mind, just say hi and uh, let us know where you're actually watching from. We'd love to be able to interact with you during this time together. Not only that, we'd love to be able to stay connected with you during the week. We have created what is called the Weekly. It's a digital online program for us to be able to stay connected. You can simply go to the URL, weekly.harvestflorida.org, and in that you'll find all kinds of different opportunities for us to continue to do community life, even though it may not be in person, but we have those opportunities to do it virtually. We've got some classes that you can sign up. Uh, we have small groups that are gonna be meeting online through Zoom as well, and we'd love to be able to connect you with that as well. If this is your first time connecting with us at Harvest, I'm gonna encourage you at the top of this page, you'll see a spot there just says new here. Go ahead and click that. Let us know that you're joining us, and we'd love to be able to just connect with you and see if there's anything that we can do for you as well. Now, let me just take a moment um, in the midst of the chaos of our week, and let's just pray and commit our time to the Lord. Will you join me? God, we thank you so much for the day. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing, and that even when things around us seem to be spiraling out of control, Lord, we know you are in control, that nothing surprises you. You are bigger than these things, and Lord, we take refuge in you. Lord, I pray that no matter where we're at, no matter what we may be dealing with, that your peace would overwhelm us in this time. And Lord, that we stay focused on the things that matter most. In your name, amen. Amen. The Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Amen. But well, we invite you to stand and worship with us as we usher into the presence of the Lord this morning. God, we welcome you. We're praying for miracles and signs and wonders. And we believe that you are able. I give you glory for all you brought me through and now I'm ready for whatever you want to do I'm moving forward to follow after you and now I'm
God of praise this morning. He is worthy of it all. Father, it's your breath in our lungs. We pour out our praise. We give you everything that we have. We yield to you this morning. We open up our hearts to you. You give life. You are love. Bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we
Welcome to Harvest Online, everybody. So excited that you're joining us today, wherever you're at at the moment. If that's on your living room couch, you're in your bedroom, uh, maybe you're hanging out on your cell phone at the park, I don't know, but either way, we're glad that you're here and joining us at Harvest Online. My name is Micah. I serve as one of the pastors here at Harvest, and you're joining us today uh, for a great week. We're in part two of a five-week series on the book of Daniel. We're gonna dive into that in a minute. Uh, but let me just reinforce what Pastor Lee said. Uh, if you're here and you're new, we would love to know that you're joining us online today. A uh, simple thing that you can do is uh, just click on the link that says new here, and we would love to just send you a couple text messages about how you can get more connected at Harvest uh, if you're interested. And for that matter, for everybody, uh, if you've not already done so, get online on Facebook and you can join our online Facebook group. Uh, when you do that, the whole point of that is that you can continue the conversation uh, about what we're learning here on the weekends and how you're applying that in your own life. We'd love to have you do that. And if there's anyone that you want to just interact with, questions, uh, any prayer requests, we have some of our leaders online. You can click the chat link, uh, or for that matter, the prayer link, and we'll be hanging out online following the service as well. So take advantage of that time to connect with somebody uh, while you're here. So last week, uh, Pastor Lee kicked off our series called Stand. If you missed that, I encourage you to catch it online. Uh, you can go back and catch up. Uh, last week, we talked about standing out. Now, next week, uh, we're going to be uh, focusing in for all of you, probably like many of us right now, that you feel maybe just a little spiritually drained or weak in this moment. Next week is called Stand Strong. And we're gonna look at how do you stand strong in the midst of difficulty or opposition. This week, uh, we're diving into Daniel chapter four. Uh, and today we're gonna to talk about how you stand up. More specifically, how you stand up for what's right. Now here's the deal. Everybody, no matter what your story, all of you will have somebody at times in your life that because of maybe unwise decisions that they're making, they need somebody to stand up for what's right, to stand up for truth, to stand up and to help them get on the right path, maybe to get right with God or to get right with people. So today matters for all of us. We're gonna see actually how this standing up experience plays out in the life of Daniel. Now there's two characters in our story today. Daniel is our main character. We're gonna see how Daniel actually stands up to our second character. Uh, the second character is the king of all of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. So at this point in the story, Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful man in the world. Uh, he oversees an empire that had been unlike any other around his time. Uh, he's at the peak of success and power. And interestingly enough, for a season, Nebuchadnezzar seems to recognize that that power comes from, well, not himself, but from God. He, he even acknowledges Daniel's God. And uh, something happens though, and that shifts for Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know if it's because like he starts to believe his own positive press or what, but he becomes prideful. And when he becomes prideful, he starts to believe that all that power, that all that success is actually, well, one, it's all because of him, and two, it's all for him. And when that happens, things shift. And we're gonna jump into our story with Daniel in that moment with the king's life. And what we're gonna see through this story is what godly 
godly, loving confrontation looks like. All right, so but before we get to Daniel 4, uh, we could take a look at what's really my favorite childhood comic. Uh, the comic strip is called Calvin and Hobbes. We want to take a look at confrontation from Calvin on this one with an ant hill. I love this. He says, hey, ant, you're working like a maniac. And what have you got to show for it? What's the colony done for you lately? What about your needs? You don't owe anybody anything. Let the others fend for themselves. He says, move out, discover yourself, express your individuality. Then he smiles. If they listen to this, that will solve our ant problem. Now, I love it. But maybe, maybe you're not naturally good at confrontation. You know, for me personally, I'm not naturally wired as a confrontational person. Uh, I'm more of a peacemaker by nature. Uh, I, in my own natural state, like I'll avoid conflict until I absolutely have to have a tough conversation. Now, over the years, I've learned that it matters and it's important, but my, my natural state is not to do that. Now, for some of you, uh, you're like that too. How many of you, raise your hand, wherever you are, if you're one of those non-confrontational types. Uh, if that's you, be, go ahead, raise your hand. All right, some, some of you, you're not raising your hand, not just because you're sitting alone online, but because you're with people, and that feels too confrontational. All right, now others of you, you are natural confrontation seekers, all right? You're not a confrontation avoider, but a confrontation seeker, all right? How many of my confrontation seekers are out there? Raise your hand where you're at, okay? So here's the thing, this, this matters. The challenge, especially for those of you that are confrontation avoiders is this, here's the problem. If we don't have loving confrontation, if there was no confrontation, our world would literally fall apart, right? I mean, think about it, without confrontation, evil people in power would step all over everybody. All right, without confrontation, kids would grow up without the skills that they need for uh, success in life and, and for healthy relationships. Now, without confrontation, you and I, we would never have developed the skills that we need either. We would probably have bad habits that eventually led to some ultimate destruction in our own lives. Now, even in our own system of government, we have confrontation built in, right? We call it checks and balances, and that's a good thing. Confrontation matters, all right? As Christians, here's the challenge. Can I just say, we kind of stink at confrontation. Now, here's why. We very often fall into one of two extremes. Now, on one end of the spectrum, uh, we might be confrontation avoiders, and we can justify that and say, like, I just like to live and let live. Uh, or maybe we just think it's none of my business. We're confrontation avoiders. That's one extreme. Now, the other extreme, you're not a confrontation avoider, but you might confront people unlovingly or unwisely. Maybe you've heard of the saying, right, drive-by shootings. And for some of you, you're like, drive by with confrontation. You know, it's, it's no context, it's no relationship, just ba 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 ba. Let me tell you everything that you've done wrong. And in that extreme, we can come off as, well, honestly, like just kind of unloving jerks, right? But in the other extreme, we bury the good uh, that could happen from us lovingly confronting and helping people get on the right path. This matters for us in a big way. All right, and it's not, here's the thing, confrontation, loving confrontation. Uh, it's not about us being right and other people being wrong, all right? But instead, it's about us loving people and wanting to help them get right with God or get right with others. Before we go further and dive into the scripture, will you pray with me? God, I am so grateful for the chance that we have to learn from uh, you, ultimately, uh, in your word and from this story in the life of Daniel. This matters for all of us. I pray for each person listening and watching online that you would use this time to encourage them in their next steps of obedience and following you. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. All right, here's, here's the deal. We're going to jump in uh, to our story in Daniel, and I want to give you a heads up of where we're going. All right, because there's a lot of words and books and things that have been written about successful confrontation. There's much that we could say. Uh, I want to share with you the essential point from Daniel chapter four. All right, in fact, you can see this with me on the screen. It's about humility. Humility, all right? Humility is the key, catch this, the key 
to standing up to sin. Humility is the key to standing up to sin. Now in Daniel chapter four, it's such an incredible book of the Bible. Um, Again, we're gonna see how Daniel uh, in humility will confront the most powerful man in the world at his time. So King Nebuchadnezzar in this situation is one of maybe the top three or four people of all human history who has attained a power and a status that's like global in reach. And now King Nebuchadnezzar, despite his great power, in this instance in the story, he's freaking out about something, okay? So he's had a dream, uh, and this dream has gotten him trouble. And he's gone to uh, people that he thought could help interpret the dream, uh, and then he ends up talking to Daniel instead, all right? And so in this place where we're gonna jump in, Daniel chapter four, in verse 10, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is sharing that dream with Daniel that he's had, and that's keeping him up, literally, at night, okay? You can read with me. He says this, uh, take a look on the screen. Verse 10 says, while I was laying in my bed, he says, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. The tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all to see. It had fresh green leaves and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. All the world was fed from this tree. Then he says, Uh, In this dream, he says, I lay there dreaming. I saw a messenger, a holy one coming down from heaven. And the messenger shouted, cut down the tree, lop off its branches, shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. All right. Then the dream continues and he uh, sees in this dream uh, that what's left is just a stump. uh, And he understands that somehow the tree uh, becomes a he in the story and the he becomes an animal like losing all human sanity and he's uh, freaking out about that look at verse 17 he says this is the reason in his dream he's told this is all going to happen says this this will happen so that everyone may know that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world that he gives to them he gives them to anyone he chooses even to the lowliest of people So then the king turns to Daniel. All right, his Babylonian name is uh, Belshazzar, because I don't know, that's fun to say. But he says this, Belshazzar, catch this. Uh, Belshazzar, he tells him, uh, that dream, that was the dream that I had, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, tell me, he says, tell me what it means. And I love this, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can do so. Well, that's convenient for them, right? Uh, I gotta wonder, is it really true that none of the wise men in his kingdom uh, could interpret this dream? Like you read the dream and it seems like your average second grader could interpret this dream, right? It's really clear. And I gotta think uh, the wise men aren't stupid, all right? They don't wanna be the bearer of bad news. They're not about to interpret this dream for the king and tell him what's obviously it means. And I imagine they're just deferring that to someone else. Like, you know, that's a complicated one, O king. Um, you know who's, who's proven really good at interpreting dreams? Remember that guy, Daniel? Maybe he can help you with this one because, man, it's a, it's a tough one. And so here he is. Now he's with Daniel. He shared his dream. Uh, it says in verse 19 that upon hearing this, Daniel, right, known as Belshazzar, was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. Do you think, Right. Then the king says to him, Belshazzar, do not be alarmed by the dream and by what it means. All right, so if you're Daniel in this situation, what do you do? This matters because you have been like Daniel in situations in your own life. All of us have had these moments where there's someone that is in our life and they're on a path that we know is leading toward destruction. And we have, we have these Daniel moments, these chances where we can lovingly bring confrontation, all right? So remember I said that humility is the key to standing up to sin. Uh, What I wanna do is just make a couple observations about this story so far, okay? Now the first is this. Notice, God, okay, in this story, God moves first. God moves first. Think about it. Who gave Daniel the dream? I mean, who gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream? God did, right? Who placed Daniel? in the king's life. God did. Uh, It's interesting. Perhaps the overall theme of this book of Daniel is what 
theologians call the sovereignty of God. This idea that God is ultimately somehow in control of everything, that, that somehow all of history is God's story and he's working out a plan and that all things are in his control. God is in control of the situation and God moves first. All right, Daniel, Daniel has to respond with humility. Uh, humility is important. Humility realizes that, that God alone can change someone's heart. So like, I'm not going to try on my own. Because of that, humility means I'm going to look in a situation for where God has already opened the door, where he's already working in someone's life. And when I notice that, then maybe it's my chance to step in and be in alignment with what God says. Because as we said, God moves first. But then God invites us to participate. So Daniel has an opportunity in this. Um, You, when you're Daniel moments, you have an opportunity to participate. So Daniel, in this situation, he has the king's ear. God has placed him in the king's life for this moment. But you have those moments too. Um, You might be a parent and and you know you've got a child that's, that's just on the wrong path. And you're wondering, like, in this situation, how much do I push in without pushing them away? And and you need wisdom and and humility because you love them and you know they're headed toward a path of destruction. You want to get them on the right path. Or some of you, you have a friend who's just, like, they're blowing up their marriage and they don't see the damage they're causing in their family. And because you love and care for them, you want to know, how do I help them get on the right path? Or you might have a family member who's just making, like, really poor financial decisions and you see if they keep on this path there's financial ruin that's headed and you want to help them get on the right path or you may you may be in a workplace and and you have that manager you know that just kind of steps on everybody's toes and it's killing morale and and when the manager comes around people like duck and cover Uh, when they're not around they're looking for another job all right and you wonder what am i supposed to do to stand up and to do so lovingly. So catch this, because this is really important. We said God moves first. Second, God invites us to participate. Humility means I'm looking for that invitation and realizing that I need God to move first. Think about Daniel and the king, all right? Uh, If Daniel was not invited to participate, confronting the king would be a horrible idea. What do you think happens uh, to people that confront the king when they're not invited to, right? But humility, humility reminds us that, um, that knowing truth doesn't mean that I have to blast that truth uninvited. Okay, can we talk about social media? This is one of the dangers of social media, right? It's so easy for us in an uninvited way to just blast what we believe to be true. And, and now, you know that there's, a, there's like a world of difference between having a one-on-one conversation with a friend about a sensitive topic and they've invited you to share some truth in that. Okay, there's a world of difference about that situation versus blasting your opinion about a sensitive topic uninvited online. All right, we need to, we need to realize with humility that an invitation is key if we're going to be involved in confronting someone in their life. Now, here's a third point. Even when we're invited, even when we're invited, confrontation, catch this, requires courage. It does. Think about Daniel. Daniel confronting the king required great courage because his life would be at risk. Now, let's watch how he does this. Verse 19 says, Daniel Belshazzar replied, I wish these events foreshadowed in this dream, catch this, would happen to your enemies, my Lord, not to you. To your enemies, not to you. All right, verse 22, he says, that tree, your majesty, is for you, for you have grown strong, he says, and you've grown great. Your greatness reaches up to the heaven and your rule to the ends of the earth. He continues on in verse 24. He says, this is what the dream means, your majesty, and what the most high has declared will happen to my Lord, the king. You will be driven from human society and you will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. You'll be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time, like I think seven years. He says, uh, you will live this way. Catch this until you learn until you learn. He goes on to say, remember, uh, the most high rules over. What do you need to learn? That the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world, and he gives to them anyone he chooses. 
but the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. And this means that you will receive your kingdom back again. Catch this. When you have learned that heaven rules. Pride. Pride was killing the king and was about to lead down a path of destruction. Now, catch this. Daniel could have stopped there, right? He now interpreted the dream. He could have left it and stepped back, but instead he takes a step forward and this requires courage. And he's gonna stand up to King Nebuchadnezzar. All right, now he's gonna do that with humility, not because he was better than or smarter than or holier than, but because he wanted to be faithful to this moment that God had given him. Look at verse 27 and see what he says to King Nebuchadnezzar. He says, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. All right, will you read that with me? Uh, be it, be bold, read out loud, wherever you're at. All right, stop, what is that word? Sinning and do what is right. I mean, isn't that just a great picture of what loving confrontation looks like in any situation, right? There are times where there are people in your life that they need to know that you can come alongside and agree with what God is already saying, that you can do so lovingly, uh, that you can do so clearly. Uh, in fact, this is a picture of what every godly loving confrontation can look like. You know, s stop spending your money foolishly and do what is right. Uh, stop spending too much time at work and spend some time at home. Do what is right. Stop treating me so harshly. I love you. I want our marriage to be better. Do what is right. Now this matters for you non-confrontational types uh, a lot. Uh, when I think of the youngest uh, of you maybe listening, like if you're kind of that college age through high school or middle school, um, you're in an environment that's unique, all right? You may or may not be naturally confrontational, but uh, the culture for you says that uh, you should avoid offending anybody. There's such an extreme aversion to, to offending anyone's viewpoint. You know, it used to be that like, I could love you uh, and appreciate you and disagree with your point of view, and we could be okay with that. This is such a challenge for you today, but here's the thing, confrontation, Confrontation always risks being offensive. Uh, confrontation always will require courage, but God will place people in your life that he wants to use you to help. Not, not because you're right, not because you're better than them, but because he wants to make them right and help them get on the right path. So we have this great spiritual picture of confrontation uh, from Daniel in this situation, right? Where Daniel doesn't confront the king because he thinks he's better than him, but at the same time, he, he's not afraid to confront the king as if the king is uh, above him and unable to be lovingly confronted. Uh, and that's the reality for confrontation to work best in any of our situations is like both parties need to realize they're both under God. Uh, no, no one of them is perfect. Only God is perfect and, and holy and without any uh, problems. You see, we need this picture of, of confrontation uh, in our own lives. Now we get a picture of what that looks like uh, in a different way in the New Testament. Um, we get an illustration of how we confront people. Uh, and let's take a look together uh, at what that can look like uh, in uh, Galatians chapter 6. Uh, in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says this. Will you read it with me? Uh, Brothers, he says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, catch this, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So what, what is the point of confrontation from this verse, right? It's restoration. And what, what is our posture? Like what should we be like in confrontation? Well, it's gentle and gentleness. All right, and I know this is hard. Uh, this is a difficult concept. Uh, man, it's, it's gonna take work, especially for those of you that aren't naturally good at this. Um, it reminds me of my experience with one of these things right here. All right, at Christmas, we bought our family a couple of these little uh, hoverboards. And can I just say, these things are super hard <laughs> to get good at writing. In fact, it can be dangerous, all right? Watch this.
<laughs> our, uh, our hoverboard at, at home is all scratched up. I, I've ridden that thing and um, I haven't crashed that bad as some of those clips, but I have jumped off of that or fallen off that thing too many times. It's awkward, uh, it's unnatural to figure out how to ride that in the beginning. And there's a reality like confrontation for many of you, many of us, uh, it's just as difficult and unnatural, but we, we have to, we have to, because we love people, because God loves them, we have to be willing to step into those Daniel moments and have a tough conversation, to lovingly confront, to stand up for what's right, not because we're better, not because we think we know more, but because we want to help people get off the wrong path and on to the right one. That verse in Galatians shows us that the heart behind that is about them, not us, that it's about their restoration. And that's really point number four is this, that godly confrontation wants something for them, not just for yourself. Godly confrontation wants something for, for them, not just for you. The heart of confrontation isn't that I'm better or that I just need you to be better even, but it's that I want something for you. You're headed down a path that's less than what God has for you, and, and I want something more for you. You know, Daniel, in, in his own confrontation with the king, he, he hopes ultimately that the king would still prosper. There's a sense of humility behind his loving confrontation. There needs to be a sense of humility that, for us, it sounds like I, I'm no better than you, but I, I see that there's something that you're stuck in. I, I'm no I'm smarter than you, but, but there's a better way than the path that you're on. It's, it's not unloving to confront someone when, when our heart is based off of humility like this. I mean, imagine you had a friend and you saw them uh, driving toward a cliff that they're about to fall off of. It's not unloving to yell, stop, stop driving that way and turn, all right? It, it would be unloving to just watch them go over the cliff and then look down and think, well, I saw that coming, all right? Confrontation when we see first that God has moved first, that he's invited us into it, that we can step into with courage, and that we want something for people, not just for ourselves, that kind of confrontation is entirely loving. Now, uh, even though we can say all of that, there, there's a danger in the midst of our confrontation. We see this in what happens next in that verse in Galatians 6. Remember where we left off? This next line is really interesting. He says, keep watch over yourself, keep watch on yourself, Catch this, lest you too be tempted. Isn't that strange? So he's talking about lovingly confronting someone, but keep watch over yourself, lest you too be tempted. Now, here's the deal. We said humility is the key to standing up to sin, uh, but humility, humility is hard to hang on to, especially in a confrontation. It's so easily for us to step into pride, especially when we are confronting someone else about the wrong choices or the wrong path that they're on. Pride, pride, pride will destroy your life and your relationships. We have to, we have to allow God to do a work in our hearts. That brings us to humility. Um, it was the source, pride was, of the king's downfall. Um, let's see what happens. Uh, pick it up in verse 29. Uh, we can read this. Twelve months later, the king was taking a walk on the flat of the roof uh, of the royal palace in Babylon. He looked out across the city and he said, look at this great city of Babylon. Catch this. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. Do you catch the pride dripping from those words? You know, pride starts off like this. He says, by my own mighty power, I have built this city. Pride says, I did it. I worked harder. Uh, I worked smarter. I went to school longer. My success is because of me. I did it. Uh, pride starts, I did it. And it sounds a little bit like this. Next, uh, I did it for myself, he says. He says, uh, this beautiful city is my royal residence. It's to display my majestic splendor. Pride says, I did it, and then it says it's mine. I did it, and it's all for me. Pride becomes the downfall of Nebuchadnezzar, but catch this, guys, lean in. Pride can be all of our downfall. All right, we, we may not have consequences as extreme as Nebuchadnezzar's in this story, 
But pride for us is going to destroy the good work that God is trying to do in our lives. Um, pride, pride, it's like us claiming to be the author of what's really a gift. So if you think about it, how much of anything good, any success in your life, really, you could say, I did it, as if it was all you're doing. Uh, think about how few things you had control over that really mattered in your own story. First, you didn't pick your parents, all right? You also, you didn't pick where you were born or when you were born. I mean, imagine the difference in your story if instead of being born today in the U.S., that you were born like 14th century Europe. You would have had a totally different life in view of success, all right? There's so much in our lives that we have to understand comes to us as a gift. We need that humility. Catch this because humility may be the key to standing up to sin. But humility, humility will also help you. Catch this. It will help you stay out of sin. Humility will help you stay out of sin. Now, unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, his pride gets the better of him at the end. Uh, we can read uh, what happens. That judgment that, that uh, Daniel was hoping would be avoided, well, it comes through. It says this in verse 33. It says, that same hour the judgment was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of heaven. He lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird claws. You know, isn't it true that, that pride always destroys our humanity? I mean, eventually, carried out to the extreme, pride leads us toward like insanity because we're not living in the real world when we think I did it and it's all for me. Some of you, some of you, you're, um, you're in a position kind of like King Nebuchadnezzar. You know, I, I want you, before we close together, I want you to consider this, that, that some of you, you're in a situation where you, you've been headed down the wrong path. I mean, you may have even had Daniels in your life who've, who've lovingly tried to say, hey, you're headed the wrong way. Stop sinning and do what's right. But you continue down this path. And maybe in this moment, what God's trying to say is, now's the time. Do what you know is right. For others of you, uh, you may be in a situation where what you need most is to lean into that Daniel moment. That there's there's someone that you need to lovingly stand up for what's right with in your own life. And I want to pray for you, for either of those situations, that we would have the courage to take our next steps in obedience to what God's doing in our lives. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you. I thank you that you love us enough that you're willing, even while we're messed up and, and broken and, and sinful and prideful people, even in that state that you reach down and love to us that you came down as Jesus for us, that you died in our place. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, that Jesus died for us. And yet, God, I thank you too, that you love us so much, you don't want to leave us there, headed on the wrong pathway, but you say, stop sinning and do what's right. And you pull us in a different direction. So I pray for those that they need to respond to the stop sinning in their own life and, and to the do what's right that they would have the courage to take steps of obedience and following you. And God, I pray for those that, that need to have some courage to be more like Daniel uh, and to lovingly bring confrontation to that person you've placed in their life, that they need to agree with what you're saying already and encourage them to do what's best and what's right. I pray for all of us that we would be that kind of church, that we would we would look a little bit more like you in our, our conflict and our confrontation, God, and that we would love others enough to help them get right with you and right with the people in their lives. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Now, before we close together, I want to share a little part of this uh, Daniel chapter 4 and how it wraps up. Because we're in such a unique situation. And I don't know all that's happening in your own life, but I imagine some of it's a little bit... Uh, like what's going on in ours. And there's a struggle for understanding how to respond in the midst of this current crisis. Uh, we may have fears for the health of our kids or our parents or other loved ones. You know, we're in this, this unique situation that we need the message of Daniel, that we understand that God, God is working behind the scenes. I love this uh, in verse 34. It says that after this time of like insanity had passed, right? 
Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he says, I looked up to heaven and my sanity returned and I praised and I worshiped the most high and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. Look at verse 35. He says this, all the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the peoples of the earth. No one can stop him. I love that. Or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? Guys, in a season of craziness like the one we're in the midst of, it's really good news that no one can stop God, that he is ruling behind the scenes, that, that whether we can see it or not, that he's not detached from our story or your story, but he's actively working in our world, in your life, in my life, and even in our world. You know, we, we need this great promise where he says that his rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. You know, God is the God of history. He's the author and you are not, I'm not. And that's really good news. If you wonder what kind of a God, what kind of a king is he? We can look at Jesus. Think about this. If anyone in all of human history could truthfully and fully say, I did it and I deserve it, it's God in the flesh in Jesus. And so what does God do with his great power and his great wisdom and his great wealth? We see in Jesus, he took all of that and he laid it down. And instead he took our sin and brokenness upon himself, even dying on the cross for us. It's good news that God is in control and that he loves us the way that we see his love played out through Jesus. No matter what's happening to you in the situation, you have that God who's ruling behind the scenes and his story isn't done yet. So glad that you're here to join us online today. Look forward to the conversations that continue this week and joining back together again next week as we continue the series stand. God bless you guys. Thanks again for joining us today. A couple things I wanna remind you, connect with us at the weekly and uh, stay up to date on different things and opportunities for us to stay connected as a community. And second of all, I wanna encourage you and just thank you all that have been giving and supporting um, Harvest and our mission of wanting to bring uh, hope and inspiration to our people during this time. And just so you know, um, if you've never connected and been uh, set up your giving online, you can simply click the give button on the, on the website up above and it'll walk you through step by step on how to actually do that and I know that we're taking some questions as a church as well about how are we helping people that are most affected right now by this um, if you would love to be able to give in benevolence to those that are in desperate need right now you can simply cl click the benevolence slash coronavirus um, uh, link and be able to give specifically to help those in dire need at this point we love you thanks for joining us and we look forward to being able to connect with you during the week.